Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Pete. If you don't know me, if we haven't met, um, I am the third person today to be wearing a jacket um, with a sort of a, a reddish hue. Um, it seems to be what, what qualifies you to hold a microphone uh, just today. But um, we, the persons and I didn't coordinate. Um, we're just so in sync, you know. Um, anyway, anyway, that wasn't on my piece of paper, and now I'm lost. Um, I'm, a part, I'm part of the team here. I'm an ordinand, which means that I'm training to be ordained, um, which might mean that some of you think that I'm insane, but um, I'm two years in, and so far, I'm, yeah, I'm really loving it. And I help to lead the character school alongside Phil and Steve and uh, Reninka, although she's now on uh, maternity leave. And today, we're continuing in our series on joy, looking specifically at the idea of identity, who we are and like, what are we for and how does this impact or inform our joy. And um, this sermon will be sort of split slightly into two parts. We'll look at the particular narratives of what, what identity is, the cultural one, and then a kingdom one, and we'll sort of whiz through that a bit, and then we'll see practically how it works out, and, and, and then we'll land. So this question of identity is a massive topic of conversation at the mo moment within our culture. And we live in a time where the main message about who we are um, is, and, and, and like how to discover who we are, is that it is totally up to us. Who we are is, is within here, and we can figure it out, and we can find it out, and we can change it, and we can reinvent it, and we can portray who we want to portray at any point. Not as a collective us, but as individuals, we figure out who we are. It is the individual that dictates who they are, and it is discovered within themselves. A while ago, I was watching a musician online, um, and a, a, a real, I, I love him, I won't, I won't name him, but um, and about halfway through their set, there was just this like back and forth between him and the audience, and he said, it's all good. You can go home, and you can wake up the next day and be someone else. If today hasn't gone very well, no worries. You can change who you are, and reinvent the day and be someone else. And this was met with an applause from the crowd as if it was some kind of liberation or freedom. You can be whoever you want to be. Individualism is more and more at the heart of our culture today. And I even found an article, I was doing a bit of research on this, a WikiHow article, I don't know if you've ever come across those online. Four ways to be who you want to be. Um, I, I read through them, I didn't think that they were very good. Um, and this journey of self-discovery and self-reinvention can take a lifetime of inner searching and inner seeking, with each day bringing a possibility of a new person to arise. And previous cultural approaches now, and indeed current nar narratives that suggest the opposite of this, that actually who we are can be defined by something outside of us, um, they're, they're now considered a tyranny. A tyrannical idea, and, qu and quite rightly, to be honest, in some cases, history is littered with people thinking of themselves as gods and as others of less of them and pushing an identity onto people so that they can be oppressed and dominated. Wars have been fought and generations enslaved and people killed off the back of misdirected searches for identity and purpose. But I'd argue today, as our culture has become more and more individualistic, our culture isn't actually benefiting from this idea of how we view ourselves. In the West, we are becoming more fractured as a society, as people gather into smaller and smaller groups of people who totally agree with themselves and everyone else outside of that party is seen as some kind of an enemy. And um, we're facing a like a mental health epidemic as well, especially in our younger generation. Our culture has birthed an unprecedented attack on our mental health as people grapple with the realities of the social media age and constant reinventation, reinvention and nowhere to really truly anchor themselves. Nothing is allowed from the outside to dictate who we are. We have to find it within ourselves and we are our own anchor. I believe our passage that we'll read in just a moment here this morning provides a beautiful counter to what our culture is offering. 
and has the power to birth a far deeper joy in our hearts than anything else has to off- has on offer. And so today, we are looking at 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. There are a few Bibles in the pews. Um, as I mentioned, the social media age, some of you might have your Bible on your phone. There's a Bible on the screen as well. So we'll read this together. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, it's a good, a good ripple of Anglicanism there as we celebrate the end of the year. Um, so let's dig into this. Let's explore this kingdom narrative of identity. But you. Okay, before we do that, we're just going to figure out who you is in the context of this letter. It's not been far off into this passage before we're on a diversion. The you in this letter is referring to groups of dispersed and exiled Christians within the Greek and Roman world. So if you think small pockets of exiled people in the Greek and Roman world, Peter had learned that these people were being persecuted and harassed and were facing hostility from their Greek and Roman neighbours and wrote this letter to encourage them in the midst of their suffering. And it's interesting to me that this bit of passage is an encouragement in the midst of suffering because Peter's advice isn't to how to stay low or keep your head down and crack on. It's not advice about which bits of society they should actually just conform to so that people get off of their back. It is a bold proclamation reminding them who they are and what their purpose is. Peter speaks to their identity and of their identity in order to encourage them. These two verses have been described as the most remarkably dense identifying two sentences of the church and what it means to be a Christian in all the Bible. So let us explore these dense verses. The first thing to notice here is that we are being told who we are. Someone outside of us is telling us who we are. Rather than a life of inner searching to discover who we are, these words set us on a lifetime's journey of receiving the gift of who we are and letting it move and change us. You are my chosen people. God is saying, plain and simple, I want you. For the Christians at the time, this was such good news. The Roman Empire at the time was saying to the church, we don't want you, get out of here, see you later. We don't want any, any, any part of you. They were pushed out and they were rejected. They come to church and they find a God who says, I want you. You are my people. And for us today, this is just as good to hear. Deep in our inner being, we are driven to find belonging. And it feels like we need to earn that belonging sometimes. But Jesus says in John 15, you did not choose me, but I chose you. We now have this deep verdict announced over our lives. God has chosen you. We are chosen and we are treasured. In our reading it said, we are God's own people. And uh, this is a direct reference to Deuteronomy 14, where God declares to Israel that they are his treasured possession. And in other translations of our reading, it says that we are God's treasured possession. Now, treasured in this word, in this, yes, this word treasure, is, uh, is the word, and so I have to clarify here, I was... I studied Spanish at school and I was told that it was in the best interest of the department that I quit. (laughs) And so I'm going to now try and say a word that is not an English word. Don't quote me on it. Anyway, the word is the word segula or segula or uh, yes, S-E-G-U-L-A, but also in Greek or Hebrew. And this word, this particular word, Segular. I'm, gonna, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna go with secular. It was used in, in, in a royal court setting. It was referencing to, to the king's gold and silver, but also 
And really interestingly, it was a term referencing the person at the king's right hand, the king's most valued and trusted confidant. So if you imagine this king had a whole court of people in session at the palace, and there was this secular, this treasured one. This king has this person who he trusts and who he shares his inner thoughts with. The whole of creation is before the Lord, always, but the church is separated out as the one who, who knows God most in, intimately. Just to put this into context, just imagine all of creation gathered in the temple of the Lord. You've got the angels there, and he's, he's, he's just, he said, oh, I'm going to announce who my treasured possession is. Out of all of creation, I'm going to say it. I'm going to tell you all now. And the angels are there, and they are feeling pretty confident because they haven't sinned, they're really obedient, and they are in eternal worship. So that sounds like you've got a pretty decent chance of being treasured and valued. And then the beautiful autumnal trees of Memorial Park, they chime in, and they're, they're stunning. I don't know if you've been to Memorial Park recently. It's beautiful. They haven't sinned either, I don't, I don't think. They are beautiful stalwart keepers of nature, a place for the birds. I've also written etc. here, but I can't figure out what else lives in a tree. Squirrels, birds and squirrels, and, and other things. They've got a good chance as well. I mean, they're, they're beautiful. I'd treasure a tree. I love a tree. All the stars burning brighter than we can possibly imagine, lighting up the infinite darkness of space, burning for millions of years for the glory of God. And we're all there, and God says, no thanks. Ash in accounting. Claire, the teacher from Crawley. John, the painter. These are my treasured possession. These are the ones that I have chosen to bring close to me. These are my royal gold and silver. This is what God says of you and of me, chosen and treasured. So he chooses us, he treasures us, and he yet goes further still. He invites us into his royal priesthood. Royal. It's hard to quite understand the significance of this statement. Charlotte and I have been watching The Crown recently. I don't know if you've watched The Crown. Um, it's hard not to just consider it a documentary, but I know it's not. It's a drama, but there isn't much that appeals to me about a royal life. Like, you get to drive some nice cars, but can you imagine the pressures and the constant scrutiny? But we all know the privilege royalty across the world has. The constant and unwavering identity as an heir or as a king or queen. That is who they are. The rule, the prestige, the honour royalty receives too. It is extraordinary. Nothing in me really wants to get close to it or even work in those palaces. It just, just feels like too much. I do not want to get close to that. But think about the royal household of heaven with King Jesus crowned in his glory. What a joy it would be to be a part of that house. That is a house that I'd like the opportunity to serve in. But everyone knows across the world you can't just become a royal you can't just say, oh, great, yeah, cool, I've enjoyed being a teacher, I've enjoyed my career in IT, I've enjoyed being a builder, and now I quite fancy in a couple of years to just become a member of the royal household, so I'm going to just think about that and just go ahead and do it. We just, we know that it just, it just doesn't make sense in our head. We just know it doesn't happen. You are born into it. You are either royal or you're not. It's just not possible. Yet God adopts us into this line into this royal household. And being adopted into this royal household means that not only do we serve a king, but we also belong to the household of the king. We are born again into this royal household in a secure place, an unshakable identity as heirs and co-heirs with Christ, as Paul says in Romans. Just as there is nothing that I can do to become a prince in the house of Windsor, there is nothing I can do that will ever shake my identity within the kingdom of God as a royal. And priesthood is very much the same throughout Israel's history. Priests of the day were from the tribe of Levi 
And you couldn't just become a priest. You had to be born into it or not. And priests in the Old Testament were specifically set apart to both represent the people of God to God and to represent God to the people. But most especially and most particularly, they were the only ones allowed into his presence, into what was called the Holy of Holies, where God's very presence was. They were the only ones invited to be close. And Peter here is saying, that is you. You are the ones that God wants in his presence. You are now priests, royal priests. When you come to know Jesus, you are born into this royal and priestly birthright. Peter is saying, you are all now royal. You can all, all of us here can function as priests. We all have access to that place of his presence. Chosen and treasured because of his great mercy, as it says, once you had not received mercy. Once we, we couldn't be with God and we weren't part of his family, but now you have received mercy. It's got nothing to do with us. This calling of who we are, it's got, it's got nothing to do with us and everything to do with God. It's got nothing to do with our ability or performance, how moral or how right we are. God looked at us you and me, and as a free gift has lavished his mercy upon us and brought us into this new identity, all found in him. So far, I've been speaking in quite individualistic terms, like you and me, and things like that. But in the verses, that, that's just not there at all. They are plural, speaking as a whole group. And in the West, it's really kind of, hard to not think individualistically it's just what we do it's ingrained into us at, at this point and to think of the to think of a, the group first in some ways takes quite a lot of effort and ends up in me at least patting myself on the back and congratulating myself for not being selfish it, but here in the verses it, this isn't how God sees us he sees us as his people a nation as one body now, it is true to say that we are each individually known and loved more than we could possibly imagine. We are each knitted together in our mother's womb. The Psalms are full of personal praise and relationship with God. He will not let your foot stumble. He who knows when I sit and when I rise. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. We are individually beautifully known by God. But without each other, who we are is not fully discovered. God calls us as one holy nation. And this nation is the biggest nation in the world. Feels cliche to say, but we are part of a global nation. 2.3 billion Christians worldwide. It's a nation without passports, without customs barriers, without a weaponized army. And within this nation, we are all equals to each other under the same king, all part of the same royal household. Now, the meaning of nationhood uh, hasn't really had much meaning to me in my life. My British passport and being in this country, I grew up with it. And so I don't really, haven't really fully grasped what it means. But recently, we've been, had the privilege of celebrating some of our Iranian family being granted leave to remain. And the joy this moment brings, it's really hit home the value of what it is to be a part of a nation, to be welcomed in to a community of people. And as Christians, we have a place to call home wherever we find ourselves. We are united as equals together in Jesus. This sense of identity as more than just the one, it goes right back to the first page of the Bible in Genesis where God said it was not good for man to be alone. We have been made for each other. And without it, without being together, we are not fully or we cannot be fully or truly ourselves. Now we are a holy nation. The word holy means set apart. And it means that there will always be tension between culture and the church. But I want to be clear, set apart does not mean distant and isolated. 
We are a holy nation right in the middle of the nation that we live in. And we are a nation that carries the Holy Spirit as royal priests and as God's chosen treasured possession. We are to speak to our culture of the wonderful works of the God who brought us out of darkness into his marvellous light. Just as Jesus spoke into the darkness of Lazarus' tomb and brought life, we are to be people who speak life to the world, calling out all the good things God is and has, has been doing. Now, where there is darkness, it needs to be addressed, but we are to be people who do it in the way that brings light and life. As a nation, we should be known as people who point to the light, not ones who highlight the darkness. And the people who stay as one as the rest of the world splits off into ever opposing factions. So that is, that's been a whistle stop tour of this new identity given to us. There is so much in there. And it's wonderful, isn't it? Chosen, royal, priests, a holy nation together with a united purpose of sharing a beautiful story of good news to the world around us, all rooted in God's mercy, we can set our anchor in him. There's such a deep security in this, and, with, and deep within us there would be an ever-resounding joy if we really grappled and grasped with this, if it really sunk into it as the free gift that it is. But the reality, at least for me, is that we live somewhere in between the two between who I think I am, what I think of myself, and everything that we've just explored about who God says that I am. When the chips are down and when things are really rough, what do you say of yourself? And where does your capacity for joy come from? Where do you draw it from? When things are going wrong, what do you say? Hey, no worries, I'm a good parent, that's all I need. I'll be all right. Actually, I believe I'm, I'm actually truly a moral person, so I will be all right. I can get my head above this. I'll be okay. It's all good. I've made it in the city. I've got some cash. I'll see this through. I'll be, I'll be fine. I'll be all right. I'm, I'm smart. I'm kind. I can figure my way out of this. I'm okay. These things are understandable, but they only take us so far and can be exhausting to keep up. Now, as I was thinking about this, as I was thinking about this sermon, my mind took me back to some memories of the Scottish mountains from a few years ago, to what is perhaps now quite a well-worn story. It was summertime and Steve invited me to join him along with Carwin and James on what is called an extreme character challenge up in Scotland. Now I know what you're thinking. By the looks of me, I'd be well up for that. I'd go, ah, go and get them. But truth be told, I'd heard of this thing and I thought that he was nuts. However, he slipped into conversation that the ticket was free and I was persuaded. I was persuaded and terrified. Now, I consider both the cold and the rain to be arch enemies of my, myself, and I wasn't particularly fit at the time either. So when the packing list came through, in my wisdom, I considered it to be quite limited and proceeded to borrow any and every extra bit of kit my brothers and my dad had going. I also, on top of that, packed loads of clothes. I packed jumpers, I packed t-shirts, I packed so many socks. My bag was full and heavy, but I was ready to take on Scotland. Now, it was an amazing trip. It was. But it was also exhausting, and I did also hate it at points. It rained loads, and we kept having to walk uphill. <laughs> and my, my feet were soaked, and my body ached from the weight of the backpack. And when I got home, I unpacked all the extra clothes that I hadn't seen, as they were warm and dry in a waterproof bag stuffed at the bottom of my bag, and I hadn't touched them. See, I packed the bag in pure fear, and I took it all with me just in case. Now, at the beginning of the trip, it is true, I had the chance to drop some stuff I didn't need. One guy brought a machete, he handed it in. I ditched one jumper, 
But I was afraid of what lay ahead and I went on with the rest of it just in case. I thought, I I've got all I need. I've definitely got all that I need. I've probably actually got more than I need. I'm definitely going to be okay. Now, the weight of a few extra things over a short walk really is nothing. It's fine. But when you've done 20K and you're halfway up a never-ending mountain in the wind and the rain, what I would have done to ditch that extra weight? For some of us, we've been walking this journey of faith with Jesus with extra unneeded weight of identities that we're holding on to. Because we think that we might need it when times get rough or because we don't know what might happen if we let go. What we're exploring today is the journey of shedding the heavy burdens of these other identities. Things that we look to to define us and secure us. See, Jesus said his burden is light, but sometimes it can feel so heavy and uncomfortable as it comes up against the other things that we hold on to. Here, Jesus is saying, you don't need that comfort anymore. You don't need that history defining you anymore. You don't need to rest on that identity anymore. Here is all you need. This, these verses, this is your packing list. This is all you need. I am all you need. And we can see that God's mercy, his compassion for us, is the origin of our identity. It is no longer up to us. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And this is who you are. It's not up to, not up to us and what we can make of ourselves. Who we are doesn't have to be a tiring game of upkeep and reinvention. It is a gift given from the mercy of a loving king. There, are free, there is real freedom in these words. And it is in these words that we can find a real joy as well. It's from this place, this acceptance of who God says we are, that a deep joy, a deep well of joy, finds its place in our heart. You're royal, chosen, priests, access to his presence. We are together, never alone. Carrying this on our shoulders and in our hearts instead of the approval of others, the need to be in the know, the need to be seen to be clever, to be successful or to be always safe. This kingdom narrative of who we are is light and life-giving and paves the way for joy to be found deep within us. We receive God's mercy again each day and live as chosen, royal, treasured priests of King Jesus. And so as I just invite the band up, we move into a time of ministry, I invite Steve to come up as well, I just ask to reflect, are you tired of the mask that you're wearing or carrying the weight of your own or others' expectations of who you should be? Are you sick of trying every other avenue to figure out who you are? God offers a new identity as a free gift an identity that sets us free to proclaim the light where there is darkness. Amen.